Good afternoon, and thank you for attending the roundtable of the 13th edition of the Spain Investors Day, titled Spanish Economic Scenario, and sponsored by HCL Tech. I, I now give the word to Adolfo Calviño Asensio, Spain and Portugal country head for HCL Tech. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. First of all, I want to thank uh, Estudio Comunicación for his invite to this event and also as well to the panelists for the time that they are going to spend here to help us understand better the near future that is coming. Uh, myself and all the HCL team really are very proud of uh, being here. It's our first presence. Uh, really, we do want to be this the first one of uh, many more to come. And uh, what uh, really I'm really honored of uh, being this, this first time here because uh, we are a demonstration of the potentiality of uh, Spain as a country to invest. As a country to invest in two, in two, uh, in two aspects. One, as a market with a high potential, with very relevant local multinationals, local companies that are really leading the pack in their own businesses. And second, because Spain is an incredible source of talent for us. Uh, uh, HCL Tech, probably most of, of, of you don't know, but it's a global company, global tech company, 13 billion uh, euros uh, revenues to, to 20,000 employees globally. Uh, uh, that uh, we work in three key, uh, Angel, hello. Uh, we work in three key business units. One is related to digital business, another one is engineering, another one is software. We also develop pro pro software products. Uh, in Spain, we have just landed, uh, well, some, so, some years ago, but really seriously, one year and a half ago, our plan is to reach out 1,000 employees by the end of this calendar year and uh, to uh, arrive to almost 3,000 in, in two years' time. Uh, then uh, I think, as I was mentioning, we are very proud to be here uh, because we are really a demonstration of global multinationals really spending money and uh, leveraging all the assets that Spain as a country has. Thanks, thanks to everybody. And uh, I give my turn to Aziz, Mr. Aziz, to That's manage. Me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Thank you, Aziz. Thank you. Well, the aim of this roundtable is to offer foreign investors an overview on Spain's economic current position through an open debate. I emphasize this, through an open debate on risks, rewards for year to 23, and also trying to project future years. We'll be talking on on the main issues, inflation, the Red Sox, we'll be talking about geopolitical risk, we'll be talking about supply chains, COVID extension, etc. But first, I have to introduce what is a very strong panel, and it's, it's a great pleasure to, to introduce the members of this uh, panel, of this round table, starting on my right with Ana Aguilar. Ana is the chief economist for Deloitte in Spain. Anna is the director of at Deloitte's economic consulting team, where she leads the digital technology and media economics service offering. She provides strategy, pricing, analytics, economic impact, competition, regulatory services to clients all over Spain. Welcome, Anna. To her right, we have Frederic Pretet, which is the chief economist for BNP Paribas for the past 20 years. Frederick has been working as a macroeconomics and fixed income strategist in various financial institutions. He's specialized in European topics as well as inflation financial products. He worked with the French Debt Management Office, being a key part of the primary dealer group. Welcome, Frederick. To his right, we have Raymond Torres, this is Español. <laughs> Director of Microeconomic and International Analysis at Funcas. We know all of us what Funcas is all about. Raymond is the Director of Microeconomic and International Analysis at Funca, a position he combines with being an associate professor at of sustainable development at the Instituto de Empresa 
and a columnist for the prestigious newspaper El País. For 90, from year 2007 to year 2016, he oversaw the research department of the ILO, the International Labour Organization, and previously he worked as an economist at the OECD. Again, gracias, Raymond Ponico. And next, but not least, my good friend, Ricardo. Welcome, Ricardo. We've known each other for a long time. <laughs> let's, let's leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> Ricardo, as, 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 as we know, is the chairman and CEO, the founder of Equipo Económico. Equipo Económico, he has been head of the Spanish Economic and Trade Office in Washington, in D.C., between years 2005 and 2006. He was appointed Secretary of the Estado, Secretary of State for Budget and Expenditure at the beginning of year 2003. He has also been a Spain's representative at the European Budget Council or the European Region Policy Council. We all agree that it's difficult to find a better panel for the discussion today. What I would suggest is that each of you take, please, no more than five minutes to present to the audience the key points KPIs uh, on the current situation and outlook for the Spanish economy in year 2003. And we will be following this order. So it's, the floor is yours, Anna. Okay, thank you very much, Assis. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of this uh, panel discussion this afternoon. I would like to start by summarizing my view on the Spanish economic outlook. And I would like to say that it's a, a view that is moderately optimistic for the Spanish economy this year. We expect that uh, Spain will grow uh, faster than other European economies, some other major European economies, as a result of the fact that uh, Spain has got characteristics uh, which uh, place it in a reasonably strong position vis-à-vis uh, -vis the characteristics of this uh, current situation. And in that context, we are expecting that Spain will have moderate but, but positive growth. And I think it's important to uh, not uh, underestimate that. It is true that it will not be uh, large growth, very significant growth, but it will still be, we expect, positive uh, growth. And in the current uh, context of uh, global volatility, global economic slowdown and global uncertainty, I think it's important that you know, we recognize that we're likely to, you know, to experience uh, positive growth, albeit not, not, not very large. What are the main drivers that, that we see from that uh, expected reasonably positive performance? The first element that I would highlight is uh, the performance of the, of the labor market. The labor market during the last year has been performing very, very strongly. Uh, that means that there are many people that are receiving an income. It is true that uh, the very high levels of inflation that we saw last year uh, partly eroded uh, some of the purchasing power, but it is also the case that we expect that inflation will be much more uh, moderate this year, it's still significantly above uh, the, the ECB's target, but uh, materially below the levels of inflation that we saw last year. Another factor that I would highlight that I think is, is very, very important and it's uh, quite different from uh, the situation we had in other uh, uh, previous uh, you know, economic uh, environments uh, and particularly you know, during the time of the financial crisis is the fact that the private sector in Spain uh, has got a strong uh, balance sheet position. Uh, during the last decade, the Spanish private sector underwent uh, a very significant process of deleveraging, and that means that although we will, uh, we're seeing already uh, increases, significant increases in interest rates, uh, overall, in aggregate, we expect that the Spanish private sector will be able to face up to, to this situation. Of course, there will be some pockets that will require assistant, assistance, but uh, we expect that as a whole, we'll be able to, to face up to it. Also, the uh, balance of uh, payments, uh, it's continued to perform strongly. Uh, it continues to have a net lending position vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, and I think it's another, another significant factor. And of course, uh, you know, we have to mention the next-gen EU funds. Um, the process of uh, those funds trickling through to the real economy has been slower, probably understandably as well, during the first two years, but we expect 2023 to be a very significant year 
of those funds arriving at the businesses, at the overall economy. Uh, despite this reasonably positive uh, environment, I think we have to also recognize that we have certain elements that we have to address in, uh, to improve our economic performance. Uh, the first one, and I will be brief, uh, the first one is around uh, the productivity challenge. We have to continue to work on raising our productivity. We need to focus on those higher value add sectors. We need to create an environment where our businesses can continue to grow. The economy took uh, significant steps uh, this year, for example, through the reformed Insolvency Act, uh, but we have more steps to take. We have to continue to broaden the range of sources of financing that we have, uh, for example, promoting private markets and, and private equity. And finally, of course, uh, just a brief mention to uh, the need to work on our public finances. We had to uh, increase our uh, level of indebtedness to be able to uh, provide solutions for the COVID challenge and now for the energy crisis. That was right to do so, but we need to start to set out a vision for how we will uh, restore a sustainable path for our public finances. Uh, the flip side of that, and I would end with this positive note, is that that environment of uh, consolidation we expect that uh, should generate opportunities for public-private uh, collaboration in order to be able to foster the uh, productive investment uh, that uh, Spain very much needs. Thank you, Anna. Frederic, you are a banker. <laughs> you are an international banker at a very prestigious bank, by the way. What's your opinion? What are your KPIs? You look at the Spanish economy from a banking let's say from a financial perspective. I'd like to add this ingredient into the conversation, please. Now, reg regarding, the, um, regarding the Spanish economy and the outlook, it is interesting to see that for Spain and for Europe, uh, the big surprise has been the resilience we have uh, we experienced over the past years. I mean, when you, I was looking for the consensus one year ago, the forecast for Europe was around four. We are going to print around 3.3, 3.5 compared to the US, and the US was four, but they're going to print at two. Uh, China is going to print three, below three. So that means Europe would outperform US and, and China over the past years. For Spain, they even outperform the outperformer, meaning that we're going to print about 4.5, so relatively a little change compared to expectation one year ago. So it's a, it's a big surprise in terms of resilience compared to the shock we experienced, which was a European shock linked to a gas crisis. So this president is really a constructive factors for, for the year uh, to come, especially at the time when over the past two months you have seen gas prices also moving on the downside. It's that offer also an advantage for the Spanish economy because yes, inflation in, in, in Spain was roughly the same than Europe for the past years, around 8.3 percent. But next year it's going to be lower than Europe because most of the inflation in Spain was energy and food. So external shock, which are now going on the other direction. From a financial perspective, it's very important because that means that you are going to move from eight to probably something like four. In Europe, it's going also to decline. So the disinflation trends is going to be uh, an important factor to even better support or improve uh, the households or the situation in terms of household purchasing powers, uh, especially for Spanish uh, consumers in, in particular. So that's something which is uh, important because in terms of uh, risk of failures, bankruptcy, which is already a risk for banking sectors, I would say. You would say you lower the risk to see a deep recession. Clearly, we are going to a kind of maybe a softish lending, which is, I would say, the, the best case for bankers, because softish lending is at a time when interest rate move on the upside, usually for the balance sheet of the, the for bankers, is relatively good, a, good, a good situation. So in terms of Spain, that's, that's relatively uh, uh, interesting and, 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 and something which is, uh, which is uh, supportive. One element which could be a bit of the risk is the fact that central banks are also hiking rates. So the risk on the link to energy prices to, seems to be diminishing, but the risk of monetary policy tightening is still ongoing. And uh, I have the feeling, and I think that most of the consensus and looking to the market expect that the ECB will continue to hike rates at least for uh, the first half of this year from a situation of 2% which is seen as a kind of neutral rate for Europe, maybe a bit higher than neutral for, for a Spanish economy. And we're going to be more into a tightening situation, maybe like between 3 and 3.5% according to, 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 to the consensus, and that's also a little bit uh, uh, our view. 
So that still creates a kind of risk, especially for a Spanish economy, which is very, uh, where the construction sector is very important in the GDP. So you can see that early indicators still suggest that construction sector is, 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 is moving on the downside. So that's, that's an element of, uh, of downside risk. What I would say nonetheless is there is a kind of good news. If you talk about disinflation now, because we're going to move, in, move into these directions, the magnitude of the disinflation is still uncertain, but you know that's going to move on, on, on the downside. That means that in terms of the volatility on the monetary policy, it's going, it's going to be less an issue compared to last year. Because when you have upside surprise on inflation, then central banks are a little bit running behind the, the data and they are little, therefore escalating uh, the uh, interest rates uh, uh, tightening. When you're going to move in time of disinflation, doesn't mean that the ECB will stop hiking right now, but in terms of magnitude, in terms of volatility, you would expect something a little bit softer. And for the Spanish economy, it's important, and for the banking sector, it's important to have a little bit of less volatility in interest rate monetary policy tightening. We're touching very interesting issues. I'm not sure of, uh, all of us are in agreement with you, but anyway. For you uh, who don't know, uh, Funcas is one of the most prestigious Spanish think tanks. So what Raymond is got to tell us is very significant. <laughs> so again, Raymond, the floor is yours. Thank you, Oasis, for the kind words. And you, you put the bar very high, I can see. Uh, the, the, your question in the beginning is, is, is very important. The, the problematic you raised is very important, and I would say uh, that in the short term, quite clearly, the, the uh, energy shock has been quite significant, both in Spain and, of course, in the rest of Europe. And I'm afraid that in the short term, still, we're going to see some of the, let's say, the negative effects of this energy, energy price shock. We're looking at the purchasing power lost by households in Spain as a whole in 2022. Uh, the estimate based on the, the data we have until the third quarter, which is almost the entire year, is that 5% uh, of uh, real incomes have been lost by households in Spain. And so uh, uh, this, this is very, very significant. It's unprecedented since the financial crisis. It has been attenuated uh, last year. It was attenuated because households could have recourse to savings, to excess savings accumulated during the pandemic. But uh, uh, our estimate is that uh, the savings rate has come uh, to the lowest level in the, in the historical series and therefore it's very difficult to envisage that a uh, household will, will have recourse again to savings in order to sustain consumption. So in the short term, this is going to dominate a little bit the outlook. So we expect this first quarter to be very weak, if not slightly negative uh, because of this factor. But otherwise, I would share very much the, the, the views that were expressed by Anna, I think, and, and Frédéric uh, of relative optimism after the, the, the first quarter because there are some significant factors. Uh, going forward. I would highlight uh, the first being energy inflation going down, but already we see that the inflation rate is the lowest in Europe. I think the second is France after, after Spain, where we have an inflation rate which is going down. Still, uh, it will be very difficult to go to 2% because there's a lot of inertia in core inflation and so on. But the fact that it's going down, it means that the purchasing power lost by houses and enterprises is going to be less and therefore the crisis is going to lessen little by little, especially in the, uh, as from the second quarter. Uh, in addition to that, um, uh, talking about energy, uh, Spain is relatively well positioned, mm -hmm. uh, both to sustain the energy shock, and we see mm -hmm. that uh, more than 30% of the liquefied capacity uh, is in Spain at the moment, and therefore, uh, you know, it, it's, it's obvious that it's better positioned than in, than in countries in, in Central Europe, for example. But even uh, medium and longer term, with uh, the potential for renewable energy, makes uh, uh, Spain, a, sp uh, uh, you know, a, a relatively w relative winner in this uh, change, in this transition in the energy mix. The second factor has to do with uh, the external sector. It's quite remarkable that despite the disappearing of tourism during the pandemic, the external surplus was maintained. Despite the energy shock, the external surplus has been su uh, sustained. Spain is only, there are only five countries which have managed to maintain an external surplus in the fir first three quarters of this year, and one of them is Spain. Mm -hmm. It's no longer Italy. I Italy used to have an external surplus for many years since the beginning of the euro, actually, and it's no longer the case. France has a, an external deficit. 
Germany still has a surplus, but much lower. In the case of Spain, it's also maintained. And behind it, what we see is a relatively strong competitive position. The competitive position is relatively good. And also, there is a possibility that, uh, given the geopolitical tensions, Spain could benefit somewhat from uh, the reorganization of global supply chains. It's relatively well positioned to take advantage of that. So energy is one positive factor for the future. The external sector and the position vis-a-vis -vis this reorganization of globalization could be another one. And I would also uh, highlight as, as a third one, the, um, I think, the uh, financial position of the private sector, including banks as well. Uh, which makes it a little bit easier to sustain the, uh, what Frédéric was saying before, the increase in interest rates vis-à-vis uh, -vis past episodes in, in Spain. So in this sense, it, that combined with the fact that for the first time in the history of Spain, in modern history of, of Spain, uh, whenever there is a slowdown, there was a slowdown, usually there was a very, very rapid increase in unemployment. It's not the case now, at least so far. And this is also avoiding opening uh, a new, uh, let's say, a new face in this slowdown if, if unemployment was going up. And this is not happening, therefore it's also supporting the financial side of the economy. Actually, uh, the markets themselves are seeing this because the risk premium has been maintained practically unchanged at uh, about 100 points, which is really <coughs> Germany, which is, you could say, reasonable. Uh, whereas in the, in the case of Italy, for example, has increased the risk premium. Uh, we see still foreigners buying uh, uh, public debt in Spain. It has increased by about eight, eight to um, uh, five thousand, uh, five billion to eight billion dollars this year, despite the ECB no longer buying uh, Spanish debt, as you know, and possibly even actually selling, starting to sell public debt in general. So, I would say, uh, from that point of view, I would say I would be uh, cautiously optimistic. But again, in the beginning, we still are going to see uh, problems. Uh, in the economy, and of course, as a major pending issue now and in the future, public finances. Uh, we estimate that the, 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 the public deficit, the structural public deficit is about 4% of GDP, perhaps a little bit lower, uh, and so that requires some action uh, looking to the future. If that was the case, I would be even more optimistic vis-a-vis -vis the future, of course. Well, thank you very much. That was a very positive view on the Spanish economy. Open for discussion, though. Uh, Equipo Económico is very prestigious. His, his reports are highly influential in Spain. So having Ricardo with us is, is a luxury. Ricardo, thank you very much. I would also like to, we, we, we will also like to hear from you this first round of KPIs on the Spanish economy. And then we'll be touching on some issues. Uh, which I would like to anticipate. I would like to touch a little bit later on political risk, geopolitical risk, I think it's very relevant, touch on Ukraine, for example. No? Maybe also touch a little bit on potential problems in supply chains, which is something also which probably affect a little bit. And also probably on China's attitude and China's reopening and the potential risk on COVID. But anyway, before we go on that, which is probably very controversial, I'd like to Listen to you, uh, Ricardo. Uh, what's your, your opinion? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Aziz, and thank you for your very kind introduction. Um, well, it's difficult to add something to all these very qualified arguments which have been used before myself, yeah? But, uh, you know, uh, last year the issue was inflation. Uh, and this year, the issue or the challenge is growth, which is, I think, is a major shift. Well, there are more than one challenges, obviously, uh, but the major challenge is will we achieve uh, growth or, uh, having said it the other way around, how deep the recession will be? Uh, in that sense, we are, we are uh, less pessimistic. Uh, than the average, and I will share with you uh, our arguments uh, why why we have this uh, less pessimistic view. You know, first of all, growth in this last year has been impressive. You know, obviously, a major part of this growth has happened in the first uh, part of the year. 
this third and fourth uh, quarter low uh, growth has been much lower. Initially, we expected this last quarter, last year, uh, growth to be negative, but now we think that it will be at least uh, positive. So, again, a very positive figure to having been added to last year's growth. This, help, this helps to have some, uh, again, positive tailwinds, uh, so as to say, which from the, obviously from the statistical point of view, will help to achieve a better figure actually this year, this 2023. And growth has been based in strong consumption, obviously being faced and being challenged by high inflation, by energy prices, by uncertainty, by higher interest rates. But employment figures have been uh, very positive. And if employment grows, this means consumption is very stable. And this means that consumption being so important in our GDP, that means obviously growth. Uh, exports are doing pretty well, you know. Uh, all, all, obviously, we expect uh, continental Europe to face difficulties this year, especially Germany. When we analyze the whole world picture, we see growth everywhere, but not in Scandinavia, not in Germany, not in Italy. And this is the, 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 the European structure, you know? And these are our markets. But figures there are better than expected as well. Uh, and then investments. Uh, and we feel pretty confident that uh, investments are still doing pretty well, and we also expect, obviously, the funds, the European funds, with the private-public collaboration to help to boost this change, this productivity improvement of our economy. Um, uh, two major issues, uh, so as to be optimistic related to this year. We expect a figure, we expect growth to be something like 2%. I think we are that's, that's above more optimistic than the average. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's above right. the government's estimation. You know, I've said that because the others, you know, at four o'clock, you know, <laughs> they need to, to, to recover confidence in what we say, you know? Uh, we expect that, you know? Uh, and because of a res resilient labor market, uh, because of uh, European figures being better than expected. You know, there is a debate what's happening in the financial markets, what's happening in Wall Street and what's happening in Washington, you know, what's happening in Wall Street and what's happening in the Federal Reserve, you know, Wall Street with a better mood, much better mood than the Federal Reserve. I think it's a question of credibility, you know. Uh, central banks have to recover credibility, which they have lost uh, at the initial period of last year. You know, they have to show that they are really committed to challenging inflation. A resilient labor market, a better than expected growth in Europe, and a very, very well-financed Spanish economy. Anna has mentioned that, Frederick and you as well. We have a positive current account, and the private sector has done uh, its homeworks in terms of reducing indebtedness. You know, in 2009, some figures to, to, to uh, help to understand this argument, you know, 2009, uh, the, the business community, the, uh, the debt to GDP ratio meant, uh, meant was something like 120 Correct. points. Now it is 75, you know, from 120 to 75 in terms of indebtedness reduction of our Spanish firms. What has happened? Well, the, uh, the problem is that uh, that that gap has been filled by the public sector. You know, in, right. in 2009, uh, the uh, private economy 120, public sector very well financed with a very reduced deficit and debt to GDP being something like 35 percent. And now it's the other way around. You know, private sector 75, but the public sector 120, 115, 116, something like that, Correct. which is the major challenge we have. 
but in terms of how the private economy is able to absorb all these challenges and all these shocks, I think much better, very much better prepared than it was during the Great Recession and obviously during the pandemic. So let's say something, some cautiously optimistic or less pessimistic that we have been during last months. Maybe to balance out a little bit, uh, I would like to ask you people a bit on the risk side, uh, because I think it's important that yes, the scenario seems pretty, you know, as you said, is very strong and expectations are reasonably good, but there are risks. Which are the risks, Anna? Um, I mean, I think, um uh, some of the most significant risks are actually, actually not uh, related to the actual economic cycle and dynamic. I think uh, for as long as we don't have additional shocks, as we have all of us described, uh, more or less we should be able to continue to have a, a reasonably positive outlook. I think the longer term challenge uh, without additional shocks is to do with, uh, as I mentioned, productivity. If we don't work on our productivity, uh, over the next few years, we will start to have sluggish growth and we will find it difficult to, uh, you know, to have uh, significant growth rates uh, that are required, for example, to work on our uh, public uh, um, um, fiscal balance. But for the short term, I think the main risks are to do with external factors uh, you know, that are somehow beyond our control and beyond our uh, ability to, you know, to, to estimate what could happen. Uh, of course, there are geopolitical risks. Um, there are risks to, get, um, uh, to do with um, developments in Asia as well, uh, not just in, in Europe. Um, and uh, you know, there, is, uh, there are risks uh, related to more persistent inflation, although we have seen inflation is starting to, to come down but there are risks with more severe, longer lasting inflation, perhaps related to some of those external shocks that is difficult to predict. And in that case, you know, the action that might be required uh, from, from cen central banks in terms of uh, maintaining interest rates for a longer time at higher rates together with uh, more severe action around reduction in uh, the central bank's uh, balance sheets. Uh, those would be some of the risks that I would see. Frederick from, Frederick from uh, bankers, from the financial, specifically financial viewpoint, what are the risks? Uh, the risk, as I mentioned at the, in my presentation, it's uh, stealing non-dress to the merger policy management. Because actually when I, think I talk about disinflation, it's going to be relatively easy to move from A to maybe four, because it's mainly energy and, uh, and food. But the most difficult part is moving from four to the two percent of the of the ECB because it is linked to domestic uh, pressure and things like this. In Spain, it is less an issue because actually core inflation, excluding food energy, is lower than European average. That's why Spanish inflation we expect it to slow uh, lower than, than European average. But for the for the management of the monetary policy, it is clearly the the capacity to to move from four to, to two and and this year is not only for for Europe it's also the year for the US at the end of this will be the year of recognition where is underlying inflation and therefore the management of monetary policy so if there could be a risk that the central banks the ECB want to hike rate even much higher than prices by the markets at the time when they are also reducing the balance sheets then you could create some noise regarding uh, interest rates and especially in a situation when you have a high indebtedness that could also um, link to um, the risk in terms of fiscal risk or fiscal volatility. You know that the resilience of the European economy, of the Spanish economy this year and next year, or this year and past year, sorry, uh, has been linked to the fact that the fiscal policy has been very active. But uh, at the time when interest rate is moving on the upside, then of course you create a kind of uh, uh, difficulty to continue to manage this, uh, this, uh, this, this situation. So that point of the, the risk is, is how much interest rate will continue to increase or not, uh, if it's got beyond uh, this, uh, this, what is pricing by the, by, 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 by the market. The other risk is also linked to the geo geopolitical situation linked, for example, to once again energy prices, because lower energy prices currently is creating like a positive momentum 
for Europe, you can see it in the equity market rally over the past two months. So it could shift on the other side. It is not our scenario because in view of the high level of gas storage today, you have the feeling that we secured this winter, which was already a big uh, issue, but uncertainty was on the next winter, but you are already seeing that given this high level of gas storage, of course, it will decline over the next two months, but the risk to the next winter is as significantly also lower. So that's explained the, the forwards drop in, in, in gas and energy prices. But China is reopening. So it's a new demands coming into the market that could create renewing upside momentum in terms of oil demand, especially. So oil prices, which is a global price for energy, would be very interesting to, to, to watch. You know that this price is uh, under the control of the OPEP. So I don't know what it's going to do OPEP with oil prices, maybe in six or, or nine months time when China will ask for more energy uh, down the road. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Raymond, why don't we focus now more on Spain? Uh, are you worried about two issues? The potential accumulation of, of, of debt, public debt on one side, and the, you know, the possibility of uh, an extended fiscal deficit mm -hmm. along the way that could jeopardize eventually Spain's competitiveness or not? Yes, I think this is uh, it's one of certainly one of the risks, not not immediately because in, indeed the pressures at least from markets is not very strong. But you're absolutely right. The, if uh, the, if there was an ability or perceived inability to reduce the gap, the fiscal gap, at least through time. I mean, it's understandable that especially in the period of economic weakening, this year economic growth will be lower than, than last year, even with the two percent uh, growth That's will right. be lower than, than last year. It's understandable that it's very difficult to reduce the deficit in a, in a slowdown situation, but at least uh, the, if, if, if a plan, if a you know, credible plan for a, a reduction in the fiscal gaps is not put forward, there could be vulnerabilities, especially if, if it's mixed with what Frederick is saying with the monetary policy issue, because if, um, for example, there the, the were tensions in, uh, within the Eurozone with uh, uh, a particular country having recourse, for example, to the TPI, uh, because they, you know the ECB will will start to uh, you know reduce its balance sheet, and therefore there could be tensions there. It's very difficult to imagine a decoupling of Spain unless a credible fiscal plan is presented. So I think presenting a credible fiscal plan has the advantage not only of ensuring uh, you know a medium, a better medium term outlook, but even as a, as a precaution, as an insurance against the monetary vulnerabilities which may happen uh, in, in, in this year. this year. So I think this is, this is indeed very important. Uh, the advantage is that uh, Spain has a bit more room for maneuver than is the case in other countries where, for example, taxation is already very high. Uh, it's very high in Portugal, it's very high in France, of course, in Nordic countries. In Italy, it's much higher. So uh, here there is a bit there and actually um, last year, uh, we saw a very significant increase in tax revenues, partly uh, because of uh, probably, probably as is suspected, I mean, there is a discussion on all what uh, Enrique thinks, but uh, probably because, um, you know, with the pandemic, there's much more um, uh, uh, digital payments and so on, and therefore uh, taxation, tax revenues have increased in a way. Uh, tax evasion has been reduced a little bit as a result of this and so I mean so the tax base is a little better and I think again you know there is there's is more room for maneuver probably in, in Spain than, uh, than in some other countries but still it has to be used through this uh, credible fiscal plan I think that would be the best guarantee both for the short term if there, there are monetary uh, vulnerabilities but even in the medium term of course. Can't agree, can't agree more. Uh, Ricardo, uh, it's your choice now. You mentioned before, and I agree entirely with you, that the key consideration is growth. Again, growth is associated to competitiveness. I mean, a country grows if it, it is a competitive country. I mean, it's, I guess we all agree with that. What would be your, in, your indications or your analysis in terms of what's Spain's competitive position? Are you happy with that? Do you, you think it needs to be improved? And in such were the case, which would be your recommendations? Uh, great point, uh, Aziz. Mm. 
Well, I do really believe we have an excellent country and we have excellent companies here being able to maintain and to gain uh, competitiveness all over the world. You know, we have excellent multinationals here. Uh, we have excellent small and medium firms. We have excellent, uh, very much placed all over Spain, excellent mid-cap family-owned companies which are doing great in terms of selling their goods and services abroad. So what would happen if we would able to achieve a higher competitiveness capacity, which is your point, so as to achieve cr a higher growth, you know? Three major issues from my point of view. Um, first one, we, in those last years, we have been used and we are still being used to the state increasingly intervening in the economy, which is a structural point, which is, uh, uh, which is an issue, I think. Obviously, there was a great reaction, uh, first because of the Great Recession, then obviously because of the pandemic. The state was there and has to be there uh, to protect the economy, to protect all people, that's right. But now uh, we, we need to see some changes in those policies and to see that regulation changes, that uh, controls are being lifted. Investment controls, for example, we still uh, have investment controls for strategic sectors. This is a huge intervention in our economy and obviously this affects uh, investments here in our country and investments are excellent news for increasing our competitiveness capacity. So first issue, reducing those introduction of the state in the economy, which has been quietly accepted, but which has to be reduced, first issue. Uh, from the macroeconomic point of view, second issue, we have to again achieve macroeconomic balances. Inflation is still there, obviously and we have to avoid second round effects. We'll see salaries have been contained this last year. We'll see what happens this year. We have to take into account that when we negotiate salaries this year, we have to take into consideration expected inflation, not the inflation we have had last year, so as to be able to achieve the infl inflation we expect to have at the end of this year, so inflation. And the major issue is uh, public debt. And the issue you mentioned, Raymond, related to sustainability of this public debt. And therefore, I think we need to again achieve a primary surplus. Last year, we achieved that was 2007. Uh, the primary surplus is like the EBITDA for a private company, you know? If you want to repay your debt, you need a positive EBITDA. If the public state, state needs to repay its debt, it's na it needs to achieve a primary surplus. And we are very far from achieving that. We have a structural deficit on something like 4%, which is still very high, second issue. And third issue, the economic policy we implement. And I think uh, investors need a consistent, coherent, economic policy which helps to have a business-friendly environment for Spanish firms. This means, this means uh, we have, you know, we have excellent institutions, we have excellent independent institutions. This means respecting these institutions. This means uh, uh, introducing and developing a fiscal policy which helps the monetary policy to challenge inflation. This means introducing structural reforms. And this means, from the point of view I have, in a moment where, uh, for, uh, uh, when, the, when, the, you know, when, uh, uh, when the production function and the production costs, some of them uh, coming from the, uh, uh, from the outside, are being affected, energy prices, financial prices, and so on, uh, we need to be able to contain all those other costs 
which affect our competitiveness capacity. Labor costs and fiscal costs. And those are being increased, which is not the appropriate way to, to gain challenge to gain all these challenges yeah. Spanish firms have to face. You know? So we have excellent companies which are able to absorb all these shocks, but uh, we would be we would do much better if all these issues can be relaxed and be focused more business friendly. It's a pity because I, I was told that by 1640 I should be concluding and it's already 45, which is very bad news. Anyway, just to finalize, assume that you have a friend that comes to you to your ear and say, I'm thinking of investing in Spain. Would you recommend me to do it? What would you answer? What would you answer? What would you answer? What would you answer? In one minute, one minute each. Please. Uh, I would say absolutely yes. Uh, <laughs> you should invest in Spain, uh, and I think uh, you know precisely you know the things that we have been describing. Generally, uh, I think we have consensus in that the view is uh, reasonably positive for Spain. I think Spain needs to use the time we have now. We don't have to um, you know we don't have to be as busy as other countries with a very, with a very short term. So we have the opportunity to focus on the longer term. And there, through European funds, through uh, fiscal stability, we have uh, opportunities uh, to boost longer-term growth for Spain, and that should be an attractive scenario for investment. What about you, Frederick? If a friend comes to you and asks the same question, <laughs> what would you answer? I would say that uh, to invest, you want to secure your cost in terms of energy, and I will uh, jump on the what uh, Raymond just said, uh, Spain is, is going to be the hub of the energy renewables in Europe, so therefore able to secure a stable price in terms of energy, and that's a very important issue if you want to invest on the long term. Me too. <laughs> 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 and you? <laughs> I mean, being in Funcas, you cannot say the contrary, because otherwise you're going to get into problems. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with the, the colleagues, and I would tell them we have colleagues like them, you know, <laughs> and that's a reason to invest here. Uh, but also, I mean, to add to uh, another argument, I would say it's not so easy to find another country in Europe where you have an ability, at least among social partners, to agree on important issues. Uh, at least since the pandemic, there have been, uh, I counted, about 12 social agreements, all kinds of things, including uh, a labor market reform. Maybe it's not the, the final reform, but at least it's a step forward. We have seen all kinds of, for example, professional training and so on and so forth. There have been the ability of social partners on the ground uh, within enterprises to agree and therefore to ensure a certain social stability is very significant in Spain. And I think that's another argument. To, to invest in this country. Well, Ricardo, it's up to you to close the session. Then just with one word, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> okay, well, okay. thank you very much, Anna, Federico, Raymond, Ricardo. I truly enjoyed it. I'm not sure about yourselves, <laughs> but I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.